Please join me in Paul's letter to Titus. It's located in the New Testament, right behind 1st and 2nd Timothy. It's right before the small letter to Philemon and, of course, the book of Hebrews. Titus, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It's my plan to begin today and throughout the months to walk through the book of Titus. And if you were to ask me, you know, why, why Titus? Why pick Titus? Well, there's a few answers that I have for that. It's kind of like my answer would be, my answer about why I picked Titus would be the similar answer to if you asked me the question, Danny, why do you, why do you drink Mountain Dew? I want to. I like it. I like the way it tastes. It tastes good to me. So I drink Mountain Dew because I want to. Why do you want to preach Titus? Because I want to, <laughs> right? Now, another answer that is true would be, well, we just got done walking through 16 chapters of gospel narrative, the gospel according to Mark. I'm sure you can recall going through all of Mark. And that's a big book. Now, I have ambitions to go to the Old Testament and find real big, long, difficult books to preach from the Old Testament. But I figure, instead of going straight from family size Snickers bar to another family size Snickers bar. Let's just have a little fun bite sized one before we get to anything difficult. So the book of Titus is theologically rich. It's uber practical and a very condensed form. So that's one of the reasons, that's a big reason why I want to preach this book. Now, another reason is uh, Owen Heary mentioned the book of Titus to me because he's memorizing it, and that's, that is honorable, that's great, he, he does a great job, and I begin to think about Titus, and I'm like, yeah, I would really like to preach through Titus, and so if at any point during this sermon series through Titus you don't like going through Titus, just take it out on Owen, okay? Yeah, I like the book of Titus, and that's where I'm preaching it, yeah, I like it because it's condensed, but really, it's his fault, it's his fault right there. I'm joking, of course. I'm joking, of course. Now, before we read, go ahead and stand with me. Hear now the words of our holy, loving, wise, and sovereign God. Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness and hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I, Paul, have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. And thus ends the reading of God's holy and great word. Thanks be unto him. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, O Lord, make known to us what you say and what you mean and why it's important and how to apply it. All the truths and wonderful realities that you have for us in these words in this passage. Lord, we pray that you would give light to our eyes, that you'd cause our hearts to be receptive and humble, that we'd be prepared to repent and believe. Oh Lord, use these verses even to draw the lost to your Son for salvation. And Lord, use these verses to build up the body of Christ, to sanctify us, to grow us, to cause us to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, wash us with your word. Help us now. In Christ's holy name, amen. amen. 
So as you can see on the back of your bulletin, I have four points and I have three applications. So point number one, Paul's description of himself. Paul's description of himself. As you can see in the first part of verse one, Paul says this. Paul, so he's the author, he's the human author that the Holy Spirit inspired to pen these words. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is Paul's description of himself. And he has two, servant and apostle. Servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, behind the English word servant, in the Greek lies the word doulos, which means slave. So Paul thinks of himself as a slave belonging to a master, and the master would be the Lord our God. Paul understands that he is, he's been set free, and he's been saved from slavery to sin, and now he is a slave to righteousness, a slave to the Lord, and he is under the Lord's authority, and he is obligated to obey his master. This is all part of Paul's mindset. This is how he thinks of himself. I am a slave belonging to another. I'm, I'm under obligation to keep the words of my master, the Lord our God. So he's a servant, or he's a slave of God. Also, he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. The word apostle, what does that mean? Well, it means sent out one. One who is sent. There are jingle bells going off. Is it me? or, or Oh, it's you? Okay. Hey, Crystal, do me a quick favor, sweetie. Would you mind putting your necklace on the chair for me? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. An apostle of Jesus Christ is one who is sent out by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Scripture, there is the narrow view and there is the wide view. So, the Greek word apostolos is used in the Scriptures to refer to being among the twelve apostles. Those who are the official representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ who play a foundational role in building the church. Right In Ephesians 2, it says the the apostles and prophets are the foundations, uh, the foundation of this temple that's being built, and we are living stones in that temple, and Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. But nonetheless, these 12 apostles play a very vital and foundational role in the building up of the church. So that's one way to understand apostle, and obviously, on Paul's mind, he's part of the 12. He's one of the 12. Throughout the book of Acts, they're referred to as the 11 apostles for the most part. Well, Paul is the 12th here. Now, apostle, apostle is also used elsewhere just to refer to a messenger. And this could refer to any Christian. You don't have to belong to the number of the 12. This is any Christian. Any Christian is a sent out messenger in that sense. You hear that from Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Paul says, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger. There it is right there. That's apostolos. Your messenger and minister to my need. So Epaphroditus is not part of the 12, but yet Paul uses apostolos to refer to him as the Philippian messenger. The Philippian sent out one. You see? So in one sense, my friends, we can identify with Paul here. We are servants of God. We belong to the Lord. We are his servants. And we are sent out ones. But Paul, when he says sent out one, he's referring to the twelve. He is the official apostle, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to read more about Paul's conversion to Christ and his call into servanthood and his apostolic ministry, I would suggest reading Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 31. 
I would read that to you, but I have a passage I want to read to you from later on in the book of Acts. It's Acts chapter 26, where Paul is standing before King Agrippa, and Paul is recounting his conversion and his call into ministry. And what I think you'll see here, even in Paul's recounting of the words of Christ to Paul, Paul will mention words such as servant and sent out one. So, this is Acts 26. I'll begin in verse 12. Acts 26, verse 12. In this connection, I, Paul, journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. And at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those, those who journeyed with me. And when we all uh, had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul. Yes, Paul's Hebrew name is Saul and his Greek name is Paul. Jesus is speaking to Paul. And he's saying in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I, Paul, said, who are you, Lord? Meaning, who are you, sir? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant. Hear that? To appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to the things those and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people, the Jews, and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. And here's why that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The me there is Jesus. Jesus is talking. Faith in Jesus. That's the end of the quotation. And then Paul says, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. This is Acts 26, verses 12 through 20. And again, it shows us Paul's conversion, him being brought to salvation, and in the same moment, his call into ministry. The Lord brings him into ministry. He's a, he's a minister in the sense of he's a servant. And he's a sent out one with a message, and he goes and delivers that message, doesn't he? He was obedient to the heavenly vision, not disobedient. He was obedient. So there we have, from Titus chapter 1, the first part of verse 1, we have Paul's self-description. It's his description of himself. Point 2, Paul's purpose. So he has a ministry, and his ministry has a purpose. What is that purpose? Well, Paul tells us. So I'm going to read again verse 1, and we're going to go into verse 2. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Here comes the purpose for his servanthood, the purpose for his apostolic ministry. For the sake of the faith, of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life. So Paul has, I believe, multiple purposes for his servanthood, for his apostolic ministry. Let me just name them for you. The faith of God's elect. The knowledge of of God's elect. And lastly, the hope of God's elect. Why does Paul so zealously serve his master? 
and deliver the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's for the sake of the faith of God's elect, the knowledge of God's elect, and the hope of God's elect. In this verse, verse 1, stands a doctrine that for some time my heart protested against. I was very stubborn, and I despised the doctrine of God's unconditional election. I would go so far as to say that the Bible doesn't teach that God elects. Well, this is awkward, because it says the word elect right here, Danny. Right? And so my heart is tender for anyone who also whether you currently or in your past, in your mind and heart, you're combating against God's sovereignty over a sinner's salvation. I understand the turmoil. I understand the confusion. But let's not turn a blind eye to what is plainly said in Scripture. So the Bible does, in fact, say that God has elect people or chosen people people that he's picked, people that he has selected to be saved. And as we see in the verse, Paul is zealous for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge and their hope. That's why he ministers. So I don't want you just to take my word for it. For I am a sinful man and not just, I'm not just sinful, I've made errors in judgment before. So don't trust in what I say, look to the Word of God. I want to read to you from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Don't believe me, believe the Word of God. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord. Why? Because God chose you. Paul just said to Christians in Thessalonica, we ought always give thanks for you because God chose you. Chose you as the first fruits of for what? What did, he, what did God choose them for? He just, did he just choose them for service? No, it says to be saved. He chose them for salvation. Because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this, he, the Lord God, called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if you noticed this, but it says God chose you to be saved, and you're saved through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Belief is an act of the will. You choose to depend on something or someone. That's faith. To take a promise serious is faith. That's a choice. And yet it says... God chose you to make that choice. So, hear me for what I'm not saying. I'm not saying only God makes real choices. I'm not saying only God makes real choices, and we don't make real choices. But I'm also not saying only we make real choices. God's choices are a facade. I'm saying God makes real choices, and man makes real choices. Incredible, right? We make real choices, but God can choose your choices, and they're still your choices. And if you go, well, I can't do that, because you're not God. You're not God. There's a lot of things that you can't do that he can do. If God had to play by those rules, you wouldn't exist because you can't speak the world into existence. So my friends, you must not think of God so manly as a human being with limitations who can't actually determine the future by his sovereign will. 
For it says right here, the Thessalonians came to faith in Christ. They made a real choice because God first chose them. They freely chose the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation because God first freely chose them. So their choice was not the cause of God's choice. God's choice was the cause of their choice. Again, believe the scriptures, not Danny Emo. He's a loser. Ephesians. <laughs> the one time. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. The same author, the same divine author, and the same human author who wrote Titus. Verses 4 through 6 of Ephesians 1. Even as he, God, chose us in him, elected us in him. So the Father chose us in Christ when? Before the foundation of the world. And why did he choose that? That we should be holy and blameless before him. He didn't choose you because you were holy and blameless. He chose you so that you would become holy and blameless. He didn't choose you because of your foreseen faith. He chose you so that you would have faith. He goes on to say, in love, the same God who elects is the same God who predestines. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. The praise of his glorious grace with, with which he has blessed us in the beloved, in Jesus Christ. Whose will? Whose will? Our will? No, according to the counsel of his will. It's his will, not ours. That's not to deny that we have a will. It's to say that God's will transcends our will. And his electing and predestining purposes are according to his will. The purpose of his will. And just in case, and if I was preaching to myself, let's say, 15 years ago, I would have to keep going. Because I would say, yeah, but that's just two passages, Danny. All right, Romans 9. Romans 9, and, and here's the one that is a nail in the heart. Romans 9, verses 10 through 24. Hear now the words of God. And not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, who's that one man? Our forefather Isaac. This is the story of Jacob and Esau. Though they, Jacob and Esau, were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Who's the caller here? God. Because of that, Rebecca was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. He chose Jacob. He did not choose. He passed by Esau. And then Paul asked the question that if you're understanding Paul, if you're understanding Paul, you're going to ask the same question. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Wait a second. God didn't give the same opportunity, opportunity to Esau that he gave to Jacob? Is that unjust? That's the question. And Paul, and Paul says, by no means. And then Paul stands on scripture, for he, the Lord, says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. That means God is saying, I am free to set my mercy and my compassion on whomever I want to. You cannot put me in a corner and say, you have to show me mercy. You have to show me mercy, God. God's like, I'm free to show mercy to whoever I want to show mercy to. And you also can't put God in the corner and say, God, you cannot show me mercy. God would say, I am free to show mercy to whoever I want to. 
And then he continues. Here's the conclusion of that verse that he quotes from Exodus. So then, it, what's the it? God's mercy and compassion. So then, God's mercy and compassion, it, does not depend on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Notice how it brought up man's will. Romans 9 teaches us that man has a will. So don't use Romans 9 to say, see, man doesn't have a will. Man doesn't make real choices. Right here it says he has a will, a real one that makes real choices. But God's saving mercy and God's saving compassion, God's gracious election, does not depend on human will or exertion or effort. That's what it's teaching. You have a will. But listen, God's election isn't according to your will. It's according to the God who has mercy, the God who calls. And Paul backs up what he says with Scripture. For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up. I, the Lord, have raised you up, Pharaoh. I've been active in your life to, to bring you to this place. And why? That I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. And oh boy, it was. And then here comes the conclusion in verse 18. Here's the, here's the, here's the thesis that Paul derives from that passage of Scripture. So then, Paul says, so then he, the Lord God, has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. See how it says wills there? God, he is free to show mercy, saving mercy on whomever he wants to. And God is also free to reserve for judgment whomever he wants to. That's what Romans 9, 18 says. I have freedom to show mercy or to harden. To bring to salvation or to reserve for judgment. That's God's right. And of course, if we're following Paul, we're going to ask the question that he raises here. Because he says, you will say to me then, why does he, God, still find fault? For who can resist his will? Now this would be a perfect place for Paul to say, guys, you've been misunderstanding me. We can resist his will. That's why he, he, can, he can find fault. He doesn't answer it that way, does he? Instead, he confirms that no one can resist the sovereign will of God, and yet people are still responsible for their sinful choices. Because he says, but who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded say to its molder? What an illustration. Well, what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Potters have that right. Why doesn't God? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power like he did to Pharaoh, has endured with much patience, listen, vessels of wrath, prepared. They've been prepared. Past tense. Prepared for destruction. In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has, which, oh, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. So he just gave us an illustration, and then he massaged that illustration to ask a question. Like a potter, God has the right to make from the same, from one lump, a vessel for honorable use and a vessel for dishonorable use. Vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath. Prepare for destruction, prepare for glory. And then he goes on to say, to apply it to his Roman audience. Even us, verse 24, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. My friends, God is not obligated 
to give to a sinner what a sinner does not deserve. God is in no way required or obligated to give to a sinner what a sinner does not deserve and what a sinner does not want. God is free from any obligation to give his gift of salvation to people who have earned the opposite and people who don't even want the gift of salvation. That's huge. My friends, if you want to read more about this, maybe you're thinking, okay, Paul talks this way, but not Jesus. No, no, no. Paul got this language from Jesus. Read Matthew 11. I have it here in your notes. Matthew 11, verses 25 to 27. Jesus himself says, no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. It is the Father's gracious will to conceal truth to certain people and to open eyes to truth for other people. That's his will. John 13, 8. That's where Jesus says, after washing the disciples' feet, he tells them, I've given you an example. Do what I do, and those who know it are blessed. John 13, 8 goes on to say, but I'm not speaking of everyone. I know whom I have chosen. Jesus said that. John 15, verses 18 and 19. Listen, Christian, the world hates you because it hated me. It hated me first. If you are of the world, the, the world will love you as its own. But because you are chosen out of the world, the world hates you. You've been chosen out of the world. My friends, let's not deny that God has a chosen people. Because Paul is zealous in his purpose and his care and his concern for the faith of God's chosen people and their knowledge and their hope. You see, let's go back to Titus chapter 1. I've gone so far away from Titus. Let me get back there. So Titus chapter 1. Notice how it says, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge, and the elect's knowledge of the truth. And then he clarifies, this, this is not a puffed up, heady, arrogant knowledge. This is a knowledge of the truth that has a transforming effect in people. It sanctifies the knowers of the truth. It changes those who know the truth. That's what he means here. Their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. This reminds me of John 17, 17, where Jesus, in his high priestly prayer to the Father, says, sanctify them, your people, with the truth. Your word is truth. Change them. Cause them to put on Christ-like character, godly character. And you do this with the instrument of the truth of God's word. That's what Jesus says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture comes from God. All scripture is profitable. There's great gain from scripture. What do you gain? You gain teaching what to believe, reproof what not to believe, Correction, how not to behave. Training in righteousness, how to behave. Why? So that you can be fully equipped for every good work. Everything that you need for life and godliness, God has given to you in the instrument, the tool of his word. And therefore, knowing the truth has this effect on those who know it. They don't just know it, they're changed by what they know. This is why Paul just read Romans and read 1 Corinthians. How many times does Paul say, do you not know? And then says, if you knew this, you would do this then. Do you not know? Knowing this has a transforming effect. And notice how it's linked to the hope of God's elect. Hope of eternal life. Reminds me of Romans 4, verses 20 and 21. Abraham, when he received a promise from God, in hope he believed Right? And then 20 and 21 say, his, he did not waver in unbelief. Abraham did not waver in unbelief. 
he grew strong in the faith and glorified God because he was fully persuaded that God was able to do what he promised. That's hope, my friends. It's a good guarantee. It's a solid certainty. It's not a wishful, I hope this happens. It's, this is guaranteed to happen, it just hasn't happened yet. This is, this is history in advance. That's hope. Hope of eternal life. God's people look forward to life with God eternally. They'll be in an environment that will not be touched by sin. They'll have bodies and their souls will be washed clean so that not even not only do you not have to deal with the, the penalty of sin or the power of sin, even the presence of sin will be scrubbed off of them. And they will, they will get to enjoy God forever and increasingly. That's their hope. This is what Paul's concerned about. The faith of God's elect, the knowledge of God's elect, and the hope of God's elect. Now, when he brings up hope, he, just got, he has to go a little bit further. He wants to talk about the God of hope. That's point three. The God of hope. Notice what it says. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I, Paul, have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Notice, who made the promise? The never-lying God. Hebrews 6, 8 tells us that it is impossible for God to lie. How is it impossible? Because God is truth and God is unchanging, which means he can't change from being truthful, from being truth. He can't lie. Or just to, to simplify it, what does John 14, 6 say? Jesus says very clearly, I am the, I'm the way and the truth, right? Finish it, Richard. You got it. No one comes to the Father except by me, right? Right? But Jesus said, I am the truth. You know what Hebrews 13, 8 says? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's, not, he's never going to stop being truthful. He is truth. Jesus said that I am truth. I'm the truth. I'm the truth yesterday, today, and forevermore. I can't stop being who I am and what I am. He's the unchanging God, the never lying God. And he made a promise to his people, and it was a good certainty. And notice, when did God make this promise? Before the ages began, before time was created, my friends. Time is a creature or a creation. The Lord our God is timelessly eternal. He created time for us to live in. Not because he lives in it. And before he created that, he already guaranteed hope of eternal life for his people. Wow. You don't believe me? Paul says it basically the same way with just a little bit different flavoring in 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9. 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Now, listen to his description here. God, verse 9, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ, when? Before the ages began. He promised hope of eternal life, his purpose, and his grace to us in Christ before the ages began. Sounds pretty good to me. He guaranteed it before our creation, before our fall, before human history. He guaranteed it. He guaranteed a good guarantee. But not only did he guarantee it and promise it, he manifested it, it says. This hope was manifested Right, it was manifested at the right time, at the proper time, which is really close to the right, same words that Paul uses in Galatians to refer to Jesus' coming. It came at the right time, at the proper time. And Jesus, the eternal Son of God, 
takes the name the Word of God as well. He is the Word of God incarnate. He is Scripture and flesh. He is the ultimate communication of who and what God is in human flesh. But Paul here talks not about the Word incarnate, but the, the Word written. At the proper time, this hope of life eternal was manifested in his word through the preaching, through the proclamation, what I'm doing now, with which I, Paul, have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Look, he's, acting, he's talking just like a servant. Remember Acts 26? Who talked to Paul? Jesus did. Did you happen to see? Take a little look. Look-see. What does he call Jesus? God our Savior. Jesus is not created. He's the uncreated creator. He is God our Savior, my friends. And he commanded Paul, and he, he's, given, he's entrusted to Paul this responsibility to preach incalculable, glorious good news. And we are kind of indebted to Paul doing that, right? I get to preach because Paul preached. We get to hear preaching because Paul preached. And the apostles preached. But just notice here, the God of hope is the never-lying God who promised hope and manifested it. And he brings it to us through his word. The word that we're studying now, that we're looking at now, that's glorious, my friends. So Paul's description of himself, Paul's purpose, the God of hope. Point number four, Paul's greeting. This is going to be short. So notice there's two parts of this greeting. There is the description of Titus, my true son, and a common faith. My friends, not only does Titus and Paul share a common faith, but we have a common faith with us and them as well. Because we believe in a common Savior. The same Savior they believe in is the same Savior we believe in. Why? Well, let's go back up to the preaching of his word. That's why. Now, that's not the coolest part of this, this salutation, this greeting here. The coolest part is the hi, is the hello. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh oh. We're good, we're good, we're good, we're good. Titus 1, verse 4. Look at the greeting here. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. He greets them with deep, he greets him with deep doctrine. You're like, deep doctrine? Yeah, he greets them, he greets Titus, his true child in the faith, with the Trinity. And you're like, okay, I see the Father, and I see the Son here, but you're missing the Holy Spirit, Danny. Am I? Isn't he the Spirit of grace and peace? Isn't he the gift that proceeds from the Father and the Son, like our Nicene Creed tells us every Sunday? We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. He's the gift that proceeds from the Father and the Son. How crazy. And you can check all of Paul's works here. He loves to greet churches and his friends with the Trinity. The Spirit is the gift, and it proceeds from the Father and the Son. Isn't that wonderful? What about applications? Well, friends, true faith in Christ is always concerned with the faith, knowledge, and godliness of others. And oh, how our the church in America misses this. True faith, sincere, genuine faith in Jesus Christ is always concerned with the faith, knowledge, and godliness of others. Paul is. Paul has genuine faith, and he's concerned about God's elect, their faith, their knowledge, their godliness, their hope. Are we? Are we, my friends? We ought to be concerned about our family's faith, knowledge, and godliness. Our church's faith, knowledge, and godliness. Our city's faith, knowledge, and godliness. 
our nation's faith, knowledge, and godliness. The world's faith, knowledge, and godliness. Right here is the reason why we get involved in matters like the abolition of abortion. God is good. He has good laws. And his laws would be better than the laws we make up. That's why we, that's why we want to change the way we educate. That's why we want to make sure that the word of God saturates and permeates all that we do because we care about God's chosen people who are within our family or maybe in our church or maybe in our city and neighborhood or maybe in our nation or the world. This is just the... Is this not the Great Commission? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all that I've commanded. This is, this is the Great Commission desire. I am zealous. I care about their faith, their knowledge of the truth, their godliness, their hope. I want to make sure they get it. This is why Paul, when he would go someplace, he'd preach the whole counsel of God. Everything that God has made known, I want to make known to you. Do we care about that? True faith in Christ rests on God's sovereignty and faithfulness as invaluable. Even, if, even people who deny the doctrine of God's sovereignty or election and predestination, they're still resting. They're just, they're just inconsistent with their beliefs. They don't pray like that. They don't say, God, you may not be able to actually save my friend, but give it a shot. No, they say, God, save my brother. Save my child. They're, they're, they ask God to do a, a unilateral act of grace upon a human will. It sounds like they believe in the doctrine of unconditional election. My friends, the sovereignty of God and the faithfulness of God makes sweet the promises of God. So if God were not sovereign, and if he were not faithful, we'd have no reason to take his promises serious. So find great comfort, great comfort in knowing the unchangeable good God who is in control. Take great comfort of having unchangeable good promised to you, unchangeable good certainties that are coming. Take comfort in that, my friends. And lastly, true faith in Christ knows truth's transforming effect. True faith in Christ has experienced truth's transforming effect. Knowledge of the truth is good soil that sprouts all the fruits of godliness. If you want to guarantee me that you will not grow in godliness, don't read God's word. You will, you will guarantee me that you're not going to grow in godliness. You will guarantee me that you will not be sanctified in Christ. If you don't read God's word, you won't be sanctified. But my friends, if you do read God's word, accept, it, just expect to be sanctified. And to be sanctified even to the point that you even bring in deep doctrines when you say hello, like Paul here. You, can't, you just love God so much that you got, you got to squeeze in the Trinity in your hellos. Unbeliever, I pray this passage of Scripture challenges you. Unbeliever, the real God is not a domesticated God. He's not a God that you can put in your pocket. He's not a God that you can, you know, play 40 chess with and win. He is a God who greatly transcends you. And you, you have... <laughs> Your mind's not big enough to understand God. May that humble you. And yeah, we talked about God's unconditional election. That should put every sinner in the proper place right now. To think that my salvation is entirely of grace. Good, because it is. Sinner, you can't bring anything to the table. The only thing that you bring to the table is the sin that makes the cross necessary. You bring nothing but your sin. So unbeliever, look to the Lord and believe. Be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, help us with this word. 
Help us to see where we ought to go from here. Help us to ponder what you've brought to our attention. Lord, may we worship you. May we worship you. And, and Lord, may your word have its sanctifying, transforming effect upon our hearts, even as we pray and as we sing and as we go about the rest of our day. Change us, Lord, for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.